Hello, hello everyone. Uh, this is Nelly, not Stephen. Sorry about that. Uh, but we can do anything online, right? Including uh, coming in as someone else. In any case, I'm going to be pink in the chat box, so Stephen, you can be any other color. This is Nelly Deutsch, and this is the second day and the final session of the second day for connecting online in its fifth year. So this is really amazing. The presenters are passionate about connecting online for different reasons, mainly for learning, but also for instruction. So they teach and learn online. If you're interested in presenting next year, you're welcome. The presenters are from most parts of the world. We've got Australia, we've got South Africa, we've got Europe, North America, United States, Canada, South America, the Far East, and everywhere. So uh, let's start the session. This is uh, a Canadian. We're in Canada now, so I told everybody to get dressed up because it's pretty cold in New Brunswick. And um, we just came back from a sunny, warm place. So, Stephen, I don't think you need any introduction. And if you do, people can ask questions in the chat box. Um, and that's it. So. Uh, Let's get started. I noticed that uh, we're going to be drawing today. Is that right? Uh, I wasn't planning on drawing, but I never rule it out. <laughs> no, because I saw a drawing there. I thought it was oh, you that... having some uh, fun. That was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for joining. If you could just add in the chat box where you are, what you're doing, and anything else you'd like to uh, add there. And uh, you don't need, need to move your slides, right? You're fine. I'm fine, yeah. So, hello, everyone. And uh, as Nelly said, my name is Stephen Downs. I'm hoping you can see my... Uh, video okay. I'm assuming you can hear my audio okay. And uh, I've got the thumbs up and that's a pretty good sign. So as Nelly suggested, I'm broadcasting you to you live from Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. Moncton is a small city in eastern Canada. And yes, it's cold. It's about minus seven right now outside and there's snow on the ground. Uh, but we'll forget about that. Uh, I'm inside, so I'm not cold. I don't need to wear my jacket or anything like that. Uh, my webcam is so super clear. Well, that's nice to hear. I got a special webcam for doing these presentations, just so that it would be clear. So great. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, and and as I talk, um, yeah, I do want you to feel free to, <laughs> nice weather in Valencia, Venezuela. I wish I was in Venezuela. <laughs> uh, I want you to feel free to um, interact in the chat room. Uh, I'm always happy to answer comments or questions as I go along. I have a presentation, but uh, if it uh, goes off the rails, I'm going to go right with it. That's fine with me. What I want to talk about, is the thinking that has led to, and, oh, that must be whoever's typing is Stephen Downs, that's Nelly. Okay, Nelly's typing in the pink, and this is me. That's me typing in the green. Okay, so I got a little bit confused there. <laughs> so, what I want to talk about is some of the thinking that has led us to create a new program here at the National Research Council of Canada. That's just my cat. You can ignore the tail. Um, the program is called the Learning and Performance Support Systems Program, and it's uh, it's a, a five-year effort to develop basically. Uh, a learning and performance support system, a, a learning, a personal learning framework. And so I'm going to talk about some of the things that we've been working on here at NRC over the last few years 
that leads us to this point. And for those of you who have heard me present before, good thing it's not a snake, yes. <laughs> It'd be a very odd snake, a furry snake. I'd love to see a furry snake, actually. Um, so we, we've been working on different projects over the last few years. Those of you who are familiar with my work in particular will be familiar with some of the themes that come up. And what's different today is the, the way it leads to the uh, learning and performance support system. Uh, Amy, I don't know why you're getting echo. Uh, I don't know if other people are getting echo. I'm not getting any, but of course I'm not speaking. I am wearing earphones, so I should be okay. No echo? Okay, so probably what's happening, Amy, is you've got audio coming from two separate sources on your computer, so check and see if you don't have two copies of the same window running or something like that. That's my best suggestion right now. All right, so let's move forward. And, uh, oh wait, there we go. So where we begin is with the change in the nature of organizations, uh, a change in the nature of, of educational organizations, but organizations throughout society in general. And William H. Dutton says it nicely. Organizations aren't thinking yet about the networked individual, the network choices and patterns of individual internet users. They're still focused on their own organizational information systems and traditional institutional networks. This is something that's going to change. Yes, right now, we're still in a world of mass, uh, of masses of people, masses of votes, masses of ideas. What this is, is you take the idea of one person and you propagate it out to the masses. So you have the visionary leader at the top, then the visionary leader has a great idea and spreads this idea. They talk about um, amplifying conferences. They talk about, uh, you know, super professors with broadcasting to classes of 150,000 people. So the idea here is that you're taking the thoughts, the ideas, the properties of one person and spreading it to the whole mass, the whole community, the whole organization. But when we look at a brain, a brain doesn't work that way. A brain doesn't take all the content of one neuron and spread it out to all other neurons. A city doesn't work that way. You don't create one building and then create copies of that building throughout the rest of the city. Rather, a brain or a city, they're both made up of different things. Each individual person, each individual neuron, <coughs> excuse me, doing its own thing, going its own way, not all by itself, but interacting, as the diagram shows. And it's in this interaction that we create cities, that we create societies, and we create knowledge. And that's what leads to what we've come to call the theory of connectivism. Connectivism is a learning theory. It's related to other theories such as connectionism, which is a theory about artificial intelligence. It's related to the theory of constructionism, which is an approach to learning. At its heart, connectivism is the thesis that knowledge is distributed across a network of connections and therefore that learning consists of the ability to construct and traverse those networks. That's kind of a hard concept, and, and it's a hard concept when what you thought of learning is that somebody has content or information that they want to send you, and your job as a learner is to receive this and to absorb this. But what we've come to understand about learning, both in individuals and in institutions, is that it's not about the transmission of information from one place to the other. Rather, what happens is in each individual, the knowledge has to be 
created all over again. It's almost like we're building it from scratch inside our own brains. And when you think about it, you know, uh, that's the only way it could be. Because there's no way to simply copy one person's neural network and put it into another person. Because it's the sum total of all of their experiences, all of their ideas, all of their thoughts, all of their beliefs. You would have to do a massive brain transplant to transfer information. No piece of information stands by itself. It's all related. And as Nelly says, why would we want to do it? It would make no sense. It's better to rebuild the knowledge in each person from scratch because each person has his or her own perspective, his or her own point of view. And that's what creates new knowledge in society. Knowledge in society is created by each person with their individual point of view interacting with the other. Typical workplace learning, the way it is today, is demand-driven, employer-driven, content-driven. It's driven by this idea that we're going to propagate or transmit the way things are done here at our company. And there's no coincidence that right now, in the workplace, in schools even, technology, learning technology, is based on things like military uh, training manuals. But organizations are evolving. Society is evolving. You know, we've, we've gone from 19th century atomistic, Darwinistic, cutthroat competition to collaboration in the 20th century. We still hear a lot about collaboration. What collaboration means is working as a team, everybody on the same page, one vision, one idea, usually following the lead of a leader who's the red dot in the, in the center there. But in the 21st century, we're moving beyond collaboration to a more egalitarian and more network-based form of organization, cooperation. And you can see the difference in between collaboration and cooperation just by looking at the diagrams. You can see many more connections in cooperation. You can see more equality among the nodes in cooperation. Nancy's not seeing any slides. Is everybody else seeing slides? And, and there's a whole bunch of ex-military. <laughs> okay, so it looks like people are seeing slides. So Nancy, I'm not sure. Maybe it's just slow. I'm not sure. Community is about interactions. It's not about spreading the word. It's not about amplification. Rather, it's about creation. We create community the same way we create knowledge in our own mind. Each individual person, each individual neuron acts as a free agent. And through the interactions, knowledge, organization, society, cities emerge as a consequence. No one person builds a city. No one neuron builds an idea. It's created by the totality working together, not following one leader, but each individual person or neuron doing its own thing in its own way. As John Stuart Mill used to say, uh, pursuing their own good in their own way. What we're seeing in this new world of knowledge is a different way of understanding things like the organization of the sciences. This diagram on the screen is an actual chart. It's taken up of citations of academic journals from one discipline to another. And as you can see, no discipline stands alone. And as you can see, no discipline is 
the mother or the queen of any of the other disciplines. He, he can see child psychology, he can see organic chemistry, international studies, plant biology, they're all part of a large tapestry. There isn't a foundation, there isn't one science that determines every other science, and knowledge is created by the interaction between them all. We can trace a path from chemical engineering to biochemistry to social and personality psychology to archaeology and anthropology to child psychology. Human cities work in the same way as human knowledge. Human organizations work in the same way as the human mind. This is a picture I drew a number of years ago to describe what a school of the future would look like. And what you should notice in the picture here is there's no school. What we have are is a bunch of individuals, young individuals, because it is school, and they're interacting in this community, in this collection of individuals connected with each other. And there's a lot to read on this slide, a little tiny text. But what they're all doing is they're all participating directly in society. They're learning by interacting. Some of them are interacting with the courtroom. Others are interacting at a, at a health clinic. Others are helping out at the garage. They're all connected with each other. They're all connected with an information network and they're all learning through practice and immersion in the wider society. School and learning isn't something we do apart from everything else. School is something we do with everything else. So we took this idea, and uh, this is George Siemens and myself, along with people like Dave Cormier and, and Rita Kopp and Helene Formier uh, and others. And we created an online course. And this is a map of the first one of these courses. It was called Connectivism and Connective Knowledge. It was, it came to be known as a MOOC or Massive Open Online Course. But really what we were building wasn't so much a course as it was a network or a community. And what we did is we structured our material not the way a military manual would be structured, not the way a hierarchy would be structured, but rather the way a city or a brain or a network would be constructed. With different parts interacting with other different parts. And the idea here is that individuals in our course would communicate with each other. They wouldn't just sit and listen to George and I sit there and talk about what connectivism is. Now, we would talk about what connectivism is, but they would do far more than just listen to us. They would listen to each other. They would explore things. They would contribute resources. Um, and as a result, the nature of the course, the, the nature of their participation in the course came to resemble the structure of the course. Now, I've got a raised hand from May. May, uh, would you like to jump in and make a comment? Is that possible, Nelly? Yes. Do you hear I me? I do. Nice. Okay. Uh, let me get the attendee here. May, has she raised her hand? I don't see. Yeah, I, she raised it and I acknowledged it. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so I can't. All right. So let me see if I can. Amy or May? May. M-A-Y. 
I don't see it. I don't see that. Oh, yeah, I Hang see on, that. I... All right, let's try it out. Let's see. Uh, I hope she's decent. I just passed on the um, <laughs> webcam. That's always um, a chance. Yeah. Okay, it doesn't look like uh, she's going to respond there. Okay. Um... All right. May, if you feel like saying anything, just add it to the chat. And if you want to speak uh, through uh, your webcam or mic, you want to use your mic, just let us know. And that applies for everyone else. I'm happy to have other people That's right. talk and contribute to the class. Now, this is a different cat from last time. This is Alex. Say hi, Alex. <laughs> uh, yeah. So... As you can see, I'm, I'm inspired by plants and animals and things like that. So, anyhow, this course was the very first massive open online course. This was the first MOOC. And it kind of surprised George and I. We expected maybe 25 people to join our course. And we got 2,200 people to join our course. And what was really interesting was it would have been a disaster if we had stru if we had structured it like a traditional course with everybody following us and everybody in the same uh, same chat room or discussion area. But because we set it up like a network, because it was distributed, because people contributed their own content and their own ideas, the course was able to grow with the population. The course was sustainable, it was dynamic, just like the community. And that's why we were able to hold a massive open online course, and that's why it was the first. So, well, everybody's seen what's happened with massive open online courses since, and it's been an interesting, uh, I don't want to say distraction, not at all, May, uh, not at all. Um, it was an interesting exercise, and of course, as everyone knows, uh, Stanford launched their own course, which got thousands of people, and some companies started up, like Coursera and Udacity, and massive open online learning became a big thing. But the idea of putting up massive courses, and especially a massive broadcast kind of courses, was never at the core of what we were doing and was, to our mind, to my mind especially, one step in a longer process. And now we're moving on to the next part of the process. But I want you to think about the model of the Massive Open Online course. There's no central core. There's no core content. There's no core group. Uh, you know, people, I may throw in content into a MOOC, but so may anyone else. Uh, Tom is saying MOOCs are too impersonal. Souks, I'm not sure what you mean by souks are better. Are you sure you're talking about MOOCs the way I was small? Well, no, this is just it, Tom. Uh, what you want to do is you want to say something like, only small open online courses are good. And why is that? So everybody can talk to everybody else. But usually what that means is so that you can have one small closed little group, right? That's the only way to have a small course. You have to close it off. But the way we set up our massive open online course is we had what could be called a community of communities. So there was always interaction. Everybody who wanted in our course could have personal interaction. It's just you didn't have everybody interacting with everybody else. That would be silly. And so the idea here was to enable a larger learning network without the traditional constraints of a course. When you're saying you want a small course, what you're saying really to me is you want something like a traditional course. Our course design is like a network or a map or a community where resources are distributed. They're not all in one place. They're all over the place in many different places around the Internet. 
and where participants are encouraged to create their own resources, their own communities, and their own groups. One of the courses that we ran was called Plank, Plank 2010. And uh, this stands for Personal Learning Environments, Networks, and Knowledge. And again, we got several thousand people in this course as well. And yeah, it's another course that Nelly took. Nelly was a, a regular visitor in all of these courses. And it's interesting to, to see how, how they've, uh, come to influence some of the things that she's done in later years. At least I think it has. She might disagree with me. Um, and one of the things about Plank is we did a lot of research about the, uh, about the, uh, nature of the interaction and the nature of the participation. Now remember, our courses were not set up the way Coursera courses or MIT courses were set up. It's not a broadcast model where there's one person in the center broadcasting out to a whole pile of people. So we had this network of interactions. And as you can see, this is our participation. Now, normally you, you'd expect participation to be dropping and, and going away. But it, if you look at, for example, the tweets, which is this blue line, or, or even the, uh, the blog posts, uh, this line here is the blog posts about the course. Uh, registration, just this blue line, it kind of leveled off uh, at just over 1,500. I think it got up to about 1,700. Um, the activity in the course, the distributed community-based activity, continued from beginning to end. <coughs> the more traditional parts of the course, for example, Moodle discussions, because we did have a Moodle discussion. You can see here, not so much. And what happens is, in a typical threaded discussion list, once you reach a certain number of people, and it's about 100, then that kind of technology becomes useless. You have too many people trying to communicate in too small a place. It's like you took a place that was designed for 100 people and put... 1,700 people in there. It wouldn't work. It'd be too loud. It'd be like trying to communicate in a room full of shouting people. That's why we set it up as distributed. So if you have this idea of a small course, and let's, is there a way to erase this? There must be. Is there a way to erase this, Melanie? I can't. I thought, you, I thought you liked it. I thought that was like part of the presentation. Yeah. Well, Oh no, I guess oh, there's an there's an X there. You gotta only you can do it. I oh, can't I do. Oh, I did okay, it. Okay, I see it. Thank you. So okay. Yeah. So let me. I'm just gonna draw here, and I want a better color. I think. Um, or actually, I want a bigger pen. Is what I want. Uh, okay, here we go. And blue. All right. So here is a traditional course. Oh, that's a bit too thick. Right. And oh. oh okay. Interesting. All right. So here's a traditional course and it's got a smaller size, right? And there's the professor at the center. The way the X MOOCs have worked is you have your professor at the center and all they did is add to the number of people and now you've got a great big course. But you still have only one person in the middle, and they're just they're shouting out, right, trying to be heard. And this is why these big courses seem so impersonal, because you're there, right? Who are you going to talk to? You, you can barely make out the professor. And all the conversations taking place in the center, and the, they do the study. And if the professor actually contributes to the conversation, that makes it even less likely that you can take part. So what was the solution? The solution proposed by, uh, uh, I've forgotten his name, uh, Tom Hodgers, was a souk or a small mooc, right? So let's think about that. What is that? Well, we'll get rid of the big thing again, and we'll get rid of all this broadcasting. So now what we've got 
is we're going to have a bunch of small courses. This X doesn't work very well. Um, okay, that line's just not going to go. <laughs> okay, so so here here's Tom's suit, and it's a little bit larger than the original course. So I'll draw it a little bit larger. But the thing is, if you want to educate 1,700 people, you're going to need 17 of them with a professor in each one, right? And you can see the problem there now. Uh, if you've got 17 of these individual courses going on, you need 17 professors, you need 17 organizations to set them up and all of that, and I'm not even going to draw 17, that's too many. Now, so think before, we had the big course, and we have 17 little courses. Neither of these are a very good solution. What we did is we got rid of the big course. Forget the big course. Oh, come on. You have to get that arrow exactly on the line. So, but we can't run 17 courses. Who has the resources? But what we did is we set up a communications network that joins all of these groups of people together. And so there it is, right? And I don't know what that box is. but So, and this is our connectivist course. And so you have really individual communities in different places, but they're not all isolated, and we don't need 17 professors. All we need is a way to make one community able to communicate with another community, and that's how we designed our original MOOC. In a very real way, the courses that were created by Stanford and, and edX and the rest of them were a step backwards. This design is the design of CCK08, CCK09, and the rest of them. And so you have the same strength as a small course where you do have a community of people that you know and you're interacting with, but you can also interact with someone here and maybe someone over there. So it's like having your community only better than having just your community. And the idea is that these interactions between these communities that take place also are just as important as the interaction from the professor or facilitator and, and interacting interacts with these other groups. Uh, Nellie's saying, I heard that Coursera is going in the C MOOC way. I wish them luck. I, I'm not sure that they can pull it off um, because they're based on venture capital funding and you you need to make money in a VC model, and it's hard to make money this way. But let me continue with the presentation. I'll tell you what we're doing as we progress. Now, this is where we are now with our C MOOCs. Where, do, where are we going? We think if Coursera is indeed going the C MOOC way, they're really playing catch up. They're trying to catch up to where we were five years ago. So, here's another course that we did. Uh, it was called Critical Literacies. And again, it's studying, yeah, <laughs> that's another one of my cats, by the way. That one's called Bart, but Bart never, uh, Bart never comes to uh, these talks. The, the first cat was Polly, and the other one was Alex. They come to these talks, but Bart's always hidden in a corner somewhere. Uh, the C in C MOOC stands for connectivist. It's a connectivist MOOC. And when I say C MOOC, I mean a course that looks like that. So you see the connections are what makes the course, are what makes the course. So, so like we talked about the research uh, that uh, Rita Kopp and uh, Helen Fournier did, measuring the interactions. Another part of the research that we've been doing is trying to understand a framework for understanding communication and new media. 
Uh, this is a structure I put together. We did it in a course called Critical Literacies. I did this course with Rita Kahn. And again, it's just trying to understand how people use artifacts to communicate online. So we're going beyond just the idea of courses based on interactions. And we're trying to understand what the properties are of the language uh, that people use to interact with each other. And what's really significant is it's not language. Um, I said in a tweet the other day, uh, uh, language is the medium of communication. It's kind of funny because when people think of language, typically they think of, of language as the communication and then the underlying uh, you know, paper and ink or uh, uh, you know, uh, digital or recording material or whatever as the media. But language itself is the medium of communication. People communicate ideas in all kinds of ways. We communicate ideas with thoughts, or with thoughts, well, we're not there yet. Uh, they communicate ideas uh, with pictures, with lol cats, uh, with videos, with graphics, with songs, with sculptures, with design. And cats communicate, especially cat, uh, but especially Bart, a lot with eyes and ears. It's fascinating to watch Bart. Bart never learned how to meow when he was a kid. I don't know why. Um, he never learned to meow, so he's a silent cat. Um, yeah, mostly silent. He's learned how to meow a bit from other cats, but he went for years without being able to meow. And so you have to look at his eyes, his facial expressions, and his ears in order to understand what he's thinking. These are a language. They're Bart's language. And Bart and I communicate using this language. And but it's not language, is it? And so being literate needs to be understood as something different than just knowing a language. And this is the frame that we created uh, to develop an understanding of that. So that's where some of the research has been taking us. And that's research that is applied to an understanding of a world in which people more and more need to be able to manage their own lives, exercise more autonomy, live, if you will, more freely. Um, as as uh, Frieri says, students are increasingly challenged and obliged to respond to that challenge and create new understandings and regard themselves as committed. You know, it's a shift from learning as receiving to learning as actually contributing and being a part of society. And what we're trying to understand is how these interactions help people, enable people to be, to create and be part of society but also the manner in which they are able to make that contribution. And that's what's leading us in the direction of personal learning environment research. So let's think about what it is for a person to learn, what it is for a person to become a part of that society. Now, there's a, a certain school of learning called constructivism, which says something along the lines of knowledge is constructed, and learning consists of making meaning. It's sort of like a, it, it's it's a correct view in the sense that constructivists do not view learning as transmission, but it's an incorrect view in the sense that they think of learning as something you deliberately build for yourself, like you're building a building or a castle or writing a sentence or something like that. But that's not what happens. When a person is creating new knowledge for themselves as part of the learning process, it's a matter of organic growth. What's happening is 
the connections are forming between the individual neurons to create this network. And so what it means is that developing knowledge is more like exercising a capacity rather than inputting, absorbing, and remembering. If we go back to the picture of the school that I had earlier, and uh, I don't know if I can go oh, yeah, I can go back to it quickly, maybe. Oh, I went too far. <laughs> There it is. If you go back to the school here, what you have in common is none of these students are receiving or inputting knowledge. They're in the community exercising their capacities, actually doing the sort of thing that they're trying to learn how to do. And that leads us to the creation of an environment, uh, if you will, a digital gymnasium, where people are able to, first of all, create these interactions, and secondly, exercise this capacity. This is a diagram that was created by Scott Wilson back in, oh, I don't know, 2006, 2007, something like that. And the idea here is the virtual learning environment, which is what he called it, is at the center, and it's built and run for one and only one individual person. This future VLE, virtual learning environment, is now a PLE, personal learning environment. And the student is at the center. And what it does is it connects the student to all of these remote learning activities. So they might put a portfolio of their creative materials in an e-portfolio. They might contact a person online and have uh, an informal mentoring session. They might post their photographs on Flickr. They might take a, or write a blog post on live journal. They might take an online course from a university. Any of a number of these interactions. And the framework of a personal learning environment is all the protocols and technologies that make this happen. So the idea here is that learning and learning environments becomes a matter of connecting you to these individual resources. Tom Hodgers is asking, isn't this dangerous in the sense of falsely or distortioned transmitted information? And yes, but what's even more dangerous, Tom, is if you have the other environment where you have one authority at the center who's broadcasting, because if that authority is is good and reliable, everything's good. But if that authority becomes corrupted in some way, then your whole society becomes corrupted. What the creation of a network for learning does is it gives you multiple sources. They're not all going to be consistent with each other. You're going to have to make choices. And in fact, when somebody comes into one of our courses, we say the first thing you have to learn how to do is how to make choices, how to pick the content that's relevant for you, and to evaluate this content. And this is another reason we did the critical literacies course. You can't simply blindly absorb content anymore. You used to do that. That was back in the world when it was safe to do that. But now you can't trust the sources of content. You might be, you know, your broadcaster might be Fox News. And if it is, what are you going to do then? Uh, you know, you're in trouble. You end up knowing less than you would if you watched nothing. So people need to be able to understand, to be literate, not just in how to read and write, but how to evaluate, classify, recognize sources, 
criticize, create, and a number of other things. And it's this increase in personal capacity that is what is the response to dangerous or, or falsely transmitted information. And indeed, it's the only defense against it. Uh, and that's a really, and I could go on for the rest of the session talking about that, but I better not because I don't, have, I only have 15 minutes left. So, and, and, and that's, so the idea here is that the knowledge that a person has is distributed across this network of connections. George sometimes says, I store my knowledge in other people. And uh, that's not quite right. Because it's not like I store my knowledge in other people, but rather the knowledge of our society is not contained just in me or just in you or just in the prime minister or whatever. The knowledge is contained in all of us. And just as an aside, this is why everyone in a society is important. Uh, everyone in a society is important because every person in a society is like part of a brain. And you might think that one person knows a lot more than another person. And you might think one person is much more important than another person. But without all of the members of society, you do not have the mass and capacity to create social knowledge. It takes every single person in the city to build the city. And if you start taking them away and leave only the important people, then you realize you don't have a city anymore. You don't have anything anymore. And the same is true with your brain, right? There's no boss neuron. Every single neuron is important. If you start taking them away, you find that you don't have much of a brain anymore. And that's why openness is so important. In a city, you have to be able to move. You have to be able to talk to each other. You need to be able to communicate. And if you start putting up barricades or putting tolls on the road, you're breaking down the structure of the city. In a brain, the same thing is true. If the connections between individual neurons begin to break down, as it does in Alzheimer's disease, then the capacity to think is diminished. In a network of researchers and science, like the diagram I showed you before, you saw how the connections were important there. Every science is equally important because every science is a part of every other science. So you can't say, well, pick the good sciences and we'll ignore the bad sciences because we don't think they're very important. As it turns out, they're all part of the same picture. And as well, the connections between them, the capacity to communicate, to, to send messages, to read each other's papers, that's crucially important. And if you break that capacity, if you start putting barriers and blocks on the propagation of social and scientific knowledge, you reduce the capacity of the scientific community as a whole to think. This is why this is also important. Sorry, end of the side. You know, it's funny, in our courses, we say there is no content. Because content is the message that one person says to another. And that's not the important thing. The important thing is the totality of all the messages, whether it's the official content or not. The content, we, we call it the MacGuffin. And it's the thing that brings the people together because they're interested in that subject. You know, they'll gather around. It's like, you know, people might stare at an accident. It's not because the accident is the thing that everybody wants to go to. It's just it attracts. The MacGuffin is a concept that comes from Alfred Hitchcock. It's the thing in a movie that all the plot revolves around. And it can be anything at all. In the Maltese Falcon, the MacGuffin is the Falcon, the statue of the Falcon. In the birds, 
It's birds. In the treasure of the Sierra Madre, it's the treasure. There's always a map with an X on it. And it's funny, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, because what's interesting about the movie isn't what everybody's chasing after. It's what they do during the chase. It's how they interact with each other. It's what we learn about their characters, about what motivates them. So the content of a course is just a plot device to get people together, to communicate, to interact, to take part in this common exercise. And in this common exercise, our connections between each other and our connections inside ourselves will be exercised, will be increased, augmented, developed. And we learn. You know, the, the, what we need to be doing is not memorizing directions. What we need to be doing is learning how to navigate. And the only way to learn how to navigate is to navigate. So, what we did at NRC is we built tools. We built tools not to create learning management systems like everyone else, but rather we built tools to create learning networks. And in particular, I built a tool called Grasshopper. If you go to my website, if you receive my newsletter, if you've taken one of our MOOCs, you've experienced Grasshopper. Why Grasshopper? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's cute now that it has RSS, and that's the name of the communications format. But actually, this name, Grasshopper, comes from 1997, 1998, when RSS was first introduced. And I was trying to figure out a way to aggregate RSS feeds, and I called my tool Grasshopper. And I wanted to call this one Grasshopper, but the name Grasshopper with the A was taken already, so I called it GRSS Hopper. But yeah, it does, it reminds me of Kung Fu, doesn't it? Uh, it reminds me of all of that. But the idea of Grasshopper, like, we've used Grasshopper to host MOOCs, but the idea of Grasshopper is it should be a node. Grasshopper is a tool that aggregates information, helps me organize information, and then helps me transmit information. And so you see, Grasshopper is a tool that allows me to be a node in a network. That's why it's going to be so hard for Coursera to make this work. Coursera is not a tool for being a node in a network. Coursera is at best a so-so learning management system. But Grasshopper is a tool for the individual. It's a personal learning tool. And that's because of the design of these online courses where we act as nodes in the network. We receive communication and we send communication. I've described the mechanism with the following slogan, aggregate, remix, repurpose, feed forward. Aggregate, coming in, remix, join different sources together. Repurpose, reshape it, create, and then feed forward. Send what you've created to other people. And that's how you become a node in a network. In a network, With Craig Newmark, who created Craigslist, says the same thing. Listen to people, he says. Repeat what they say, he says. Then get out of the way. I do a little more than simply repeat, right? I try to combine. I try to build on. I try to learn from. You know, each neuron is part of the overall process. We're not simply blindly passing on what we've heard. We're thinking about it, filtering it, processing it, manipulating it, and then feeding it forward. We bring something of ourselves to the equation.
we can, we can think of different types of knowledge. We can think of social knowledge, which is made up of the connections between all the individuals in society. We can think of personal knowledge, which is made up of the connections and the neurons in our mind. We can think of scientific knowledge, that's a third kind of knowledge, all the connections between all the different scientific publications and experiments. We can even we can even think of things like cricket knowledge. That's all the crickets that communicate with each other. That was described by Duncan J. Watts. We can think of power knowledge. That's the way all the power stations and the electrical grid combines, and so on. There can be many types of knowledge. And all of these different networks, these different webs of knowledge interact with each other. An individual's becomes their contribution to social knowledge. The knowledge of a society contributes to the knowledge of an individual. So there can be very large networks, there can be very small networks, and it all forms one very huge complex network with multiple sizes, etc. I'm not going to go much over time uh, because I have something I have to get to as well. So. Um, so here's the design. Here's a personal learning environment on someone's desktop. Here's a personal learning environment. Somebody's using a web application. Here's a personal learning environment. Somebody's using a widget. Here are some third-party services. Here's a, a P2P service for direct person-to-person -person interaction. Here's somebody interacting on a mobile device. And you get this whole network of separate, independent devices working together. And that's how you create your learning network. So a few years ago at National Research Council, we did an in-house testing project called PLEARN, Personal Learning Environment, get it, the, or Personal Learning Environment and Resource Network. Cool name, eh? If, if you ever see that somewhere, we came up with that and they stole it. Uh, somebody will probably say, oh, yeah, we came up with PLEARN. But actually, so anyhow. So we had cloud services in PLEARN. We had the aggregation, individual profiles, a content editor, a recommender, and basically the idea here was to create a proof of concept of a personal learning environment application. So here, for example, is the aggregation, new stock search, etc. And there, it's very similar to the old Google Reader or Feedly or, or anything like that, except we, we wanted to do far more than just RSS. We wanted to hook into search. We also hooked into things like email. We hooked into things like um, SharePoint and shared directories and the rest. We used a technology we developed called Resource Profiles. And the idea of a resource profile is we don't store all of our information about something in one place, but rather this information is distributed across the network. So even my own personal information could be in many places. If you think about that, that's exactly what we do in society at large. We don't do it online, really. But if you think about it, here is me. My credit card information is stored at the bank. My passport information is stored at the government. My IQ information is a deep, dark secret. My shoe size information is stored in my shoe, which is the best place for it. I don't have a criminal record, so it's not stored anywhere. My school grades are stored at the college and university. My driver's license is stored uh, with the Department of Motor Vehicles, and my name and my age are on my birth certificate, which is stored in a hospital somewhere. And all of this interact, all of this information, I have it in a wallet. Sure, well, not all of it, but a lot of it. 
but it's all also stored in some third party place. It's online. And that's true of information about resources as well. So we can have information about the readers of a resource. We can have information about content ratings, Amazon listings, price, ISBN, etc. So we designed a framework of three kinds of metadata. First party metadata created by the author of a resource. Second party metadata created by the user of a resource and third-party metadata created by uh, a third party, a ranking agency, a pricing agency, a review agency, somebody who neither created nor uses the resource. Today, you're beginning to see the beginnings of this kind of structure being created and used on a wider scale in a project called Experience API, or XAPI. It's being created by Advanced Distributed Learning. It's also known by the name Tin Cam for some reason. And they're beginning to do this idea of creating metadata about usage of resources by individuals. So we developed resource profiles. API stands for Application Program Interface. And the idea of an API is if you have one computer program and you have another computer program and you want them to communicate with each other, what the, what the API does is it defines the manner in which that program communicates. So that is an API. So the Experience API, what it does is it looks at how you interact with a program, and then it sends that information generally to a learning management system. We will simply send it to ourselves because it's personal. That's just it. Valentina says Google collects all personal information. We think that's wrong. We think the only person who should have your personal information, the source of it, should be you. So. Little bits of things are kept all over the Internet, but when I use an application, that information comes back to me and I store it in my personal learning environment. We designed different ways of interacting with the same kind of information. We called them scaffolds. And so you might have the same data, but see it as text, see it as a game interface, see it in a calendar interface, see it in a flash chat, or see it in a video chat. The same information can be viewed in different ways. So that leads us finally to the LPSS project itself, Learning and Performance Support Systems. This is a large initiative that's been developed by the National Research Council, it's being led by myself, to create a single point of access to all skills development and training needs. It is a personal learning environment. It's a lot like your wallet. It's personal and you can carry it with you. Wherever you go, you can have your learning with you either in your mobile phone or in applications that are located in the environment around you, doesn't matter. It's a network. We don't put everything in one place, but rather what we've created or what we're in the process of creating is an infrastructure that links all the resources relevant to learning, not just courses. That's really important. Sure, we'll access learning resources, but we're also accessing people. People who can teach you, people who can answer questions, and we're also accessing credentials. If you've learned something, if you've gone through some learning experience and developed the capacity, some third party will attest to that, and you can store a link to that in your personal learning environment. In the PLE, create your own individual learning path. The application is aware of what you are doing and where you are doing it. 
And only it is aware. It's personal. It's not like you're telling Google. It's like you know where you happen to be. Your own information is searchable and verifiable. But it can also be tailored to the needs of industry, such as your employer. We can set it up so that your employer feeds information into your PLE. For example, suggested resources. For example, um, uh, suggested learning paths. Somebody's asking, what is that statue? I'm not sure. I know it's a picture I took. I believe it's from Venezuela, but I'm not sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just grabbed it quickly uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's always available, and it provides point-of-need performance support. Will all school kids have Google Glasses in the future? Think about that. Think about that question for a second. If all kids have Google Glasses, do they need to be in school in the future? See how you change the meaning of the question? You can just change it around a bit. So LPSS is composed of five major projects. The resource network or marketplace, automated skills development and recognition. We will look at how experts perform their tasks and determine what it is that makes a person an expert and what somebody else needs to do, not learn, what they need to do in order to become an expert. We'll have a personal learning record that you own, not Facebook, not Google, not some institution. You own your personal learning record. And a personal learning assistant, which is your interface, to all of these resources. And so that it's available wherever you need it. Learning as a cloud service, which is deeply integrated into external systems. So you can access it not just in your home or your office or your school, but wherever you happen to be. So this is a list of some of the things that we're working on in order to make this infrastructure the case. User data knowledge, access management, workflow management, analytics, intelligent tutoring to some degree. There's a, a large stream of learning, uh, learning technology, pedagogy, skills, competency, and proficiency framework. We're looking at frameworks like 10 competence and other frameworks for representing competences. Where will we store it on the cloud without Google getting it? One of the things we're looking at is something called own cloud. I'm just typing it out. Um, and basically, and, and I actually have, I don't know if you can see it, uh, way down behind my uh, clothes hanger, also known as an exercise machine, uh, you can sort of see the light flashing there. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it. See that there? Just under the chair. That's a hard drive. It's a network hard drive. That's my cloud. Everybody will have one of those. No, they'll have a neater home, too. <laughs> but somewhere in their house, probably not on the floor where the cats can get it, they'll have their own mini internet, their own web server, their own personal information, all of their records stored in my living room. So Google can't get it. So Facebook can't get it. And then I'll have backups, but not all in one place. And so my information, my identity, very important, remains my own. So almost at the end, what about fires? Well, that's why you have a backup. Uh, always have a backup. But don't back it all up in one place. Uh, I have, um, right now, we're up yeah, basically in the cloud. Um, I back up my information. I have some of it on Google Drive. I have some of it on a service called Cubby. I have some of it in Dropbox. I have some of it in Flickr. It's all over the place with different identities. 
So people don't know that it all belongs to one person. And so the whole idea here is that my PLE manages all of that. So from my perspective, I just have access to all of this information. And it's stored in my home, and it's stored all in different names under different identities in the cloud. So there's no way for someone like Facebook to come along and create a profile and then sell it to marketers to sell me uh, silly widgets or whatever. Can you keep track of it? That's what that's what LPSS does. We have you see here in this diagram something called a common platform that coordinates all of the different services, including the personal cloud for learning. And this tool is what we use to manage that all. LPSS stands for Learning and Performance Support System. And uh, it's interesting you change that to apps. That's kind of funny. Uh, but uh, And it's composed of these elements, Resource Repository Network, Personal Cloud for Learning, Personal Learning Record, Automated Competence Development and Recognition, and Personal Learning Assistant. Resource Repository Network is the aggregator part. It's the part that connects out to the rest of the web, to the rest of the internet, not just to RSS feeds, but to email, to shared directories, to corporate directories, to MOOCs and other online courses. Anything out there that's not mine, the resource repository network connects me to. It connects me to my social networks, Facebook, Twitter, etc. It can manage multiple identities so that I don't have to use the same identity on each one of these different uh, uh, social networks. That's what we're building, uh, and different emails, yes. And that's something I also do. I have many different email addresses. Um, and of course, I have my one public one. Actually, I actually have two public ones. I have a personal one and a work one, and then various others. <laughs> um, so, we're just launching it. The official launch was the 1st of January. Uh, it's a five-year program, and uh, we hope to have something opened to everyone uh, probably uh, in September. We'll have something very early. At the minimum, uh, you'll be able to access uh, hosting services for uh, things uh, like a MOOC hosting service, so you'll be able to access a, a copy of Grasshopper. But we also have, hope to have initial PLE functionality available as well. Um, we won't be able to build this all ourselves. It's a huge project. So that's what the orange boxes are. These are what we call implementation projects. We will be working with companies, with universities, with governments, and other partners in order to, to build all of the different systems. Uh, and who is we, you ask? It's the National Research Council of Canada, and it's the LPSS program. That's who we are. So that's my presentation. I didn't go too far over, but thank you very much, and it's been a pleasure being able to talk to all of you today. I'm amazed that that's what uh, the Canadian government is doing. Is that what you're? That's why it's the National Research uh, Council of Canada. I'm I'm amazed that you know an organization would be uh, part of that. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it has taken us a long time to get to this point. Um, it, it's taken the work that we did in MOOCs, all of the stuff we did in MOOCs, all of the stuff that we did in PLEs, all of that's led to this. And, and even more, they, they put me in charge of it. So <laughs> right. that that's that's good. That 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 kind of throws me off. That uh, a government uh, organization would be part of that. So that's that's really uh, nice to know. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. I, uh, I'm looking forward to said, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, it must be late in many parts of the world. Stephen, if you can join us, 
in the uh, course area for questions, that would be great. It's closed. It's not open. Um, I have to go. I, I, I have a one hour. Not, now. Now. So is not that... now. I meant like later. Yeah, I'm not, not. Yeah, send send me that link, and I'll, I'll certainly later on. I'll go in. I'll see what the questions are. I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, I'll do that tomorrow. So get your questions in like right away. And okay, that's great. All great. of my cats have gone to sleep. I'm sorry. So there's no cats in there. Oh, well, there's. Oh. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Cats are very relaxing. Yeah. Very, uh, yeah, they're good. All right, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, this was being recorded for YouTube without anybody's name except for Stephen. So I hope you don't mind oh, I'm being on YouTube. If you I'm always happy. Oh. You know that. <laughs> always happy to okay. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stephen, for joining us and for providing us with so much. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it.